Hey and welcome, Hammy here and some law news and debate today. We'll be talking about what to some may be a small point of Overwatch law news, but I think it has some interesting wider questions for how we all interpret Overwatch's story and where it could all be going. So, like me, you probably thought that D.Va was a pro StarCraft or a world champion StarCraft player. The revelation to some from Michael Chi is today that StarCraft was not her best or only game that she played, actually not her world championship winning game, has confused some and simply outraged others. It sparked many debates on Overwatch storytelling, including criticism of retconning and much, much more. So, in this video, I want to discuss what Blizzard have actually said about this, then examine where this D.Va StarCraft information and perception has come from in the past, then look at both sides. Is this really a retcon by the true definition of it or not? And you know what, if it is, is it that bad? Should we be upset by this really? How much can we demand fact perfection? And how much do we in general allow storytellers to tweak their stories as they go anyway? Finally, I'll talk about why this might actually be being said now. And that might actually be a good piece of news. Time codes are in the description below if you'd like to skip. Okay, so what is the news and the share that's caused so much discussion? Well, Michael Chu replied to people on Twitter saying, it's a common misconception, but D.Va wasn't a StarCraft pro before joining Mecha. So D.Va is not a pro gamer who specialized in StarCraft. And this was followed up due to the confusion with a forum post where Chu made a few different points. Basically, the long story short of this, and I've linked to it in the description below if you want to go have a look, is that Blizzard imagined that D.Va was most known and specialized in a game with a skill set that was closer mapped to the skills that she and the other mecha pilots used while piloting their mechs. That said, D.Va has played more than her fair share of StarCraft and a slew of other games. StarCraft was one of D.Va's father's favorite games and he was pretty good at it. Now that has a precedent as well in voice lines in other games which I'm going to share with you. But the fact that D.Va is a world champion professional gamer but her best game wasn't StarCraft has upset a few people. But should it have done? Let's look at the information that has caused people to think this. Well, D.Va's bio on the official Overwatch website has always stated world champion, but it's never said on that website bio that she was a StarCraft champion at any point. However, even from when she was announced at BlizzCon 2015, this of course was when Chris Metzen was still with Blizzard, Arnold Sang and others in the panel introduced her as a StarCraft player. Other sources and team members over the years since, until this post yesterday, have said that and expanded on it as well. She does have a lot of StarCraft related voice lines with heroes in Heroes of the Storm. You can check out my videos on that that are also linked in the description below. But remember that anything she says there isn't canon in Overwatch. It's long since been established by Michael Chu and the Blizzard team that anything in other games is not canon in the Overwatch universe. So we can't take anything any Overwatch hero says in the Nexus in the Heroes of the Storm voice lines as Overwatch fact. Now, D.Va is also actually in StarCraft. Blizzard introduced announcers to StarCraft. Now, when you play StarCraft and certain events happen, you have an announcer that tells you what's happening or alerts you to various things going on in the game. The very fact that she has a StarCraft announcer further ties her to StarCraft as a game that she certainly enjoys. And this, of course, just reinforces in everyone's minds that she's a pro StarCraft player. Here are a few examples. You're at max supply. Attack move to win. My dad always researches that one. Research is done. That one's been in for years. Also, when this pack was announced, the StarCraft blog on it actually said that D.Va was the number one StarCraft player in the world at the age of 16. Reinforcing this and this, along with a page when D.Va was actually announced on the StarCraft 2 website, were used by many people as supporting evidence to show that she was a StarCraft professional world championship winning player. Now other people have cited a recent interview comment from Jeff Kaplan where he said in an interview on Blizzard World that D.Va is a StarCraft player. This has been a thing that has been out there in the public sphere for quite a while and Blizzard hasn't felt a need to correct it until now. So why now? I'll talk more about that later. So if you add all of these things together you can understand where the perception has kind of come from. Even though the official website has never specifically said that D.Va is a StarCraft champion, the way that she was introduced way back in 2015 and different things that different members of the Blizzard team have said since have kind of reinforced this perception. And you know, in May 2016, myself writing and the mystery guest voiceover, some of you long-term channel watchers of this channel might recognize, said, in Diva's Law Voice Lines and Interactions videos, we presume that she's a StarCraft champion from her page that she had when she was introduced on the StarCraft website. As you can see, it says she became the number one ranked player in the world, proceeded to go undefeated for the next three years in all competitions. Her race is random, so she can play any race in theory. And she's playing in the WCS Code S series in Korea. Now, WCS is the StarCraft World Championship, the name of the series, and Code S is the name of a league that used to be done in Korea as well. 
So I put all of that together, people think one thing, it gets repeated, people like myself make a video about it, maybe draw out of it, write fan stories, and thus such a thing gets cemented in the sort of general consciousness of us Overwatch fans. Now, I will say this, whatever the original intention of Diva's gaming history was, I see no reason to disbelieve Michael Chu's post or anything he says on this personally. Diva has been promoted as a world champion gamer with strong StarCraft ties, at the very, very least, and directly mentioned as being a StarCraft champion or player in places by different Blizzard team members and different bits of Blizzard, like the StarCraft piece of Blizzard, at different times. I'll discuss all of that in a bit because I think it's important. That may not actually be a law inconsistency, more a side effect of the way that the Overwatch team has evolved, they are trying to evolve the story, and how they, with good intentions, try to sustain a large amount of communication with us, Overwatch fans, on a lot of different fronts. Okay, so after all that, you might be sitting here and saying, Hammy, well, this is obviously a retcon, how dare they, this has destroyed my view of D.Va, and you know what, if you feel like that, that's your opinion, and I understand why, because there have been inconsistencies. But is this actually a retcon, and what do you think a retcon is? Sometimes I think that Blizzard can't win either way in situations like this. Before I go on, I remember way back when D.Va was first announced, even before Overwatch was out, there was a common thing in the community for a while. How does a StarCraft pro actually even equate to D.Va flying a mech and being recruited for this Korean army force. Now, I can't talk to numbers, but I definitely remember that sentiment being in the community, the Overwatch community at the time, late 2015, early 2016, when D.Va was announced as a hero. So Blizzard probably took notice of that way back then. Then when this change is actually made, saying, well, actually, we always saw D.Va as being into a game that was more in line with the skills you need to fly a mech. We suddenly see a lot of people now saying that they really, really like D.Va's StarCraft Association. So I'm sure people have changed their mind over a couple of years. They've got used to the idea of D.Va and StarCraft together and they like it. But remember that if we change our minds and if we change how we see things, then Blizzard telling the story can, of course, do so too. And as a result, we can't always please everyone. Now, for those of you who disagree with that, I do completely understand and agree with you that in specific things that Blizzard have said over the past three or so years, and that's quite a long time, there is not a huge degree of consistency at points. But I think that this is as much an consistency and communication issue due to the way that Blizzard's dev team like being open and discussing with their community. And we don't want the dev team to be shut off from us for fear of saying something wrong that we then pick on as a community. We have to accept as a result that if we want to have dialogue with the development team, then this kind of thing is going to happen sometimes. People are humans, they try and get in touch and discuss things through Twitter, people might be tired, and without a big layer of PR or screening or managing of messages then we are going to have the occasional thing like this happen from time to time. If we want to be able to have discourse and conversation with the people who make this game that we love so much and are so engaged with and so invested in in terms of its story and so many things about it and we want to talk to them as humans rather than what they say to us being sent through seven layers of fact and copy checking and bureaucracy then we have to accept that sometimes they're going to say things in a way that could be a bit confusing or they can say things and then they need to correct themselves because they're people. That for me is not a comment so much on law accuracy, more just in terms of how these kind of conversations can come up and how we should make sure that we are understanding on our side of things as well. Now, is this an actual retcon? Well, it depends if you see this as being a fact that Blizzard have put out there in a uniform, 100% consistent way and then gone back on, or whether you see it in the way of a character that had just been announced and launched and Blizzard were excited and said a bunch of stuff about them at the time, the community got this perception of her, Blizzard then, or other bits of Blizzard, like the StarCraft team and other people then sort of turned around and said, oh, Deep is a StarCraft player. They didn't correct this perception. Then Blizzard kind of said it themselves, but other teams of Blizzard in some other ways. And then Michael Chu has come out and made this clarification right now. And whether it's more of a consistency of communication thing rather than actually a law change. Now, me personally, I can see why people might see this as a retcon, but personally, I don't think it's a hard retcon or necessarily even a retcon or a bad thing that some people are very, very concerned about. And why do I feel this way? Well, I'm quickly going to explain. We need to have a look at Overwatch's story and its development with wider viewpoints than this single issue, or even saying, oh, Overwatch retcons. Have a look at Overwatch's story from the perspective of Blizzard games in general and how Blizzard have handled story over two decades and then over Overwatch's story over the last two or three years since before launch even and the trends with that. 
So firstly, Blizzard's other storytelling. Well, Blizzard as a company, let's not forget, are used to this level of scrutiny. They have developed long narratives with multiple people working on them for many, many years for communities who have followed those games for more than two decades. Warcraft is 24 years old this year, launched in 1994. Diablo, 22 years old, 1996. Starcraft, two decades old this year, 20, 1998. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that people get it right all the time at all, but Blizzard have been doing this for a while. They are used to this level of questioning. In fact, cool aside, there is a job at Blizzard which is kind of like the Blizzard historian. I think there's a head of law as well. There are two or three people whose job it is to be law keepers who help maintain the law look at consistency and help consult and advise the various Blizzard teams on the various Blizzard worlds, universes and storylines and they put together materials on that. How I would love to do that for Overwatch. If you're a Warcraft fan or not, you may have even seen a few years ago the infamous red shirt guy. At BlizzCon he asked a question pointing out a law inconsistency in Blizzard's portrayal of certain dwarves in a World of Warcraft city that then went viral and he was correcting Chris Metzen, the Blizzard story and universe absolute legend. You can get to the stage as a company where you have so many different people over a long period of time working on things that the odd inconsistency is going to spring up here and there. The second thing I think we need to take into account with this is how stories are told and evolve anyway. Telling of stories naturally changes direction over time if they're longer stories or deeper or more involved stories or universes. Sometimes changes have to be made to account for that in the past story, particularly if there's a new story direction. And that's what people classically refer to as retconning. In Overwatch, this has happened already in a few different points. Now, because of the cadence or the pace of which Overwatch story has been told and released, we as a community take anything we can as absolute fact quite a lot of the time and analyze it. And I know I certainly do an overanalyze it for additional meaning that we might be able to glean. And Blizzard sometimes encourages us to do this by putting teasers in various lore assets and stories and things. A few quick examples, Mercy's age has been changed. She was made older than she originally was in her website bio to give her more time to complete her MPhD and also to make the terrific discoveries that she made in the world of medicine. We've also been told that various old images or various pieces of art should have shown various heroes as being older looking than they actually were. And this was because the art was made such a long time before that by the time various character stories had evolved and been expanded upon, the art that was originally out had since become outdated. A really good example of this is if you watch the Overwatch cinematic when it was announced at BlizzCon way back in 2014 now. So it's going to be four years since it was announced uh, at BlizzCon 2018. We universally accept this piece at the beginning as not showing Overwatch in its entirety. Take this image of Genji and Farah next to each other if that is Farah. We know that those two weren't in Overwatch at the same time now. But the point is that as the story develops, then some things in the past do become outdated and will need tweaking or changing or just ignoring. So when we look at the development of an ongoing and in-depth story, we have to accept that there will be a bit of tweaking around the edges at some points. Now, the other thing that I think you can see here is a bit of a trend, or we can almost see Overwatch's story, we should see Overwatch's story in two phases, pre and post First Strike's cancellation. Now, I've talked about First Strike on this channel for the last couple of years, if not more. It was a graphic novel planned to be telling the story of Overwatch's First Strike team during the Omnic Crisis. There was clearly a phase at Blizzard, and this is pure speculation on my part, where there was a big decision to try and take the story perhaps in a different direction. The team did a lot of interviews saying that the community after launch were having a big engagement with the universe and Blizzard saw themselves as being custodians and wanting to almost work with the community to sort of shape the narrative in some ways. They weren't going to be high handed and dictate what was going on because of how engaged people were with their all different storylines. Blizzard wanted to give us as a community room to imagine ourselves and to try and tell our own stories a bit within the Overwatch universe whilst they told theirs as well. Chris Metzen then retired and shortly after that in November 2016 it was announced that First Strike was cancelled. Now Michael Chee's post at the time said we've done a lot of development on the universe and its stories in the years, years since First Strike's conception. Now remember that Overwatch released May 2016, this announcement was in November 2016, so since Overwatch was announced and before, so since 2014 and before, there's been a lot of development done on the universe and its stories. While the core of the story remains, we have changed and expanded upon how we see the events that took place during the first days of Overwatch. Now I'd actually say in retrospect, this was more than just the events that took place during the first days of Overwatch. And after the launch and how engaged people were around Overwatch and its characters and story, Blizzard decided to go for this more open, 
uh, growing, continuous narrative approach rather than one big sort of handed down from on high version of canon and the story. And that's probably what First Strike would have been. First Strike would have given a big, 100 pages I think it was, slice of the Overwatch world and set a lot of things in stone in all of our heads story-wise. Now, don't get me wrong, personally, I would love to have read that. I was so disappointed when it was cancelled. But at the same time, if Blizzard want to adopt this storytelling approach, then First Strike would have been very restrictive towards that. It would have set so many things as canon or in stone that it would have restricted their storytelling ability in future. So, at some point, I think there has been a transition in Blizzard's thought as to how they wanted to tell the story of Overwatch and how it would be very different to the way that they've told a Warcraft story or a Starcraft story or a Diablo story, the big tomes, the big story chunks that are instantly set down as canon by us in the community, and going for this more organic, growing, moving on approach. Now, the challenges of that are exactly the things like this diva thing. If the community get something in their head and regardless of what it's based off and I completely understand that in this case there are a lot of things that Blizzard or other parts of Blizzard said that made D.Va seem to be a StarCraft world champion as things that the Overwatch team have said themselves but different members in different places at different times. I still feel that's more of a consistency of team communication thing uh, due to the way that they try and engage with us rather than the law inconsistency in that particular context. But whether or not you see this as a retcon, and I get it if you do, there is an argument as to whether retconning is bad. Should we be getting upset by this? Well, retroactive continuity, and that's what retcon is for short, is an established literary or storytelling device. You adjust things, you ignore them, sometimes you contradict them, and it may break continuity with what has been said down in stone, canon, however you want to put it before. Now, there are good reasons to do this sometimes. It does increase an author's creative freedom, but it has to be used to a point where the audience for that creative work, for that story, doesn't feel that it's just getting too absurd or too crazy. If the new story is going to be a better one that can be told than the story that had been told before, and that the audience are going to enjoy it more, then the author, the creator, should have some freedom, in my opinion, to do that. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I, in recent years, have very much gone into my comic book TV series, films, and reading comic books as well. If you enjoy comic Comic books or comic stories do give me a shout what you enjoy watch and read most in the comments below I'd love to chat about that with you but for you comic book fans how many times have various characters been changed over a set period of time over decades that their stories have been told some since the 1950s and before I've been watching just as one example a lot of the flash lately and there have been a fair few incarnations of mr. Barry Allen for example. Any comic book TV series, and indeed a lot of storytelling that's done over a prolonged period of time, will show different versions of a story, will show different creative directions, will show new takes on the character and characters. Now, comic books do this a lot sometimes by setting a prior story in a parallel universe, uh, meaning that any popular characters that have departed can be reintroduced, or all new stories or angles can be taken on heroes or villains by just putting them in another parallel universe, and that's a fairly common technique. Now, now, comic books are definitely a big influence on Blizzard. In a launch interview with Rock Paper Shotgun, Michael Chu actually talked about that and said, Overwatch owes a huge debt to superheroes and comic books. I remember some of our earliest memories working at Blizzard would be sitting with Chris Metz and our creative director talking about what was going on in Green Lantern or Spider-Man. Now in the future, and this is complete headcanon for me, it would be so easy, so, so easy to have Tracer start causing, oh, I don't know, temporal anomalies when she travels through time, or perhaps she already has when she had the slipstream accident. Maybe this is a whole parallel universe. Now, whether you think that sounds amazing or absolutely terrible, your opinion is your own. We can't deny any storyteller the right to be able to do that. You can't deny the author of an ongoing story that is trying to open itself up to engagement from you know the people who read it, the ability to change it a little bit as they go, particularly when it's over such a long period of time comparatively that we want to know details on. We want to know about our heroes as children. We want to know about them around the first Omnic crisis and all different kinds of things. To say to Blizzard you have to get everything right perfect in amazing detail first time is almost to deny them the opportunity to hopefully establish a universe with firm foundations for a long storytelling future. And the game hopefully and the story hopefully are just in their infancy right now. We are, you know, almost two years this May after Overwatch launched. So finally, why could this retcon, if you see it that way, or why could this clarification be a good thing? It is a very, very, very small detail. 
but it is an important detail to people who like Diva. So why say this and why now? Well, think about what I call the unstoried characters. I've always said that there are characters who have had no major presence, like a central role in a short or a comic or an origin trailer if they're a new hero, on any lore material since launch. Now they are Lucio, Zenyatta, Mercy, yeah, good luck with writing that one, by the way. Uh, I love the character of Mercy. I can't wait to find out her background. But giving any character detail to Mercy at this point whatsoever, because she's the most popular Overwatch played character and to so many people, you're not going to be able to keep everyone happy with that one. But the final one of those heroes is D.Va. Now, why would you bring up a little fact about D.Va now? It could just be a small tidbit to keep us talking about the law, and that's well-intentioned and good if it is that. We don't want Mr. Chu to stop doing that. But what if it isn't? What if changing Diva's story to ensure that when they do make law for her, that they can go into more interesting detail, tell a better story in her background, or do something a bit different story-wise than her just being a StarCraft player? Which could mean that D.Va story is incoming this year, and I really hope that's the case as an unintentional D.Va and tank main over the last couple of competitive seasons. But what do you think about that? Could we be seeing a D.Va short or a D.Va comic soon? That would be absolutely amazing, and I'd love to see that if so. What I would love to know is what do you think? What do you think of this change? Has it offended and affronted you? Are you sad about this? Do you feel that D.Va's lost something? Or do you kind of understand where it's come from? Where would you like to see D.Va's story go and Overwatch's story go over the next year? Do let me know in the comments. If you've got to the end of this, well done. Do share with me your favorite diva voice line in the comments below. My favorite has to be Happy Halloween at any time of year. I think it's wonderfully seasonal and very appropriate. Every day when I'm playing Overwatch is Happy Halloween Day. Cheers for tuning in. Do like, throw a subscribe if you enjoy this. If you'd like to see more Overwatch lore interactions, voice lines, analysis, and discussion and thoughts like this, please do check out the playlists linked here. Big shout out to my supporters on Patreon. YouTube are still demonetizing or part monetizing for a period of time. 50% of the videos that I upload, partially as a result of all of the stuff that went on with YouTube last year about the various adpocalypse and YouTube trying to restore advertisers' faith in content. If you enjoy the vids I make, please do visit patreon.com forward slash hammy and see how you can get involved in a few rewards and from just a dollar, pound or a euro a month, support me to help making more of the videos you enjoy. Cheers for tuning in. I've been Hammy. Take it easy.